All right, so go up, uh, welcome everybody to the after school lecture, The Emergence of the Modern Presidency. We're going to be covering from George Washington all the way through FDR and how the president has emerged over you know, the, the couple of centuries as the leading force within our political system. So we'll start by looking at this historical debate about the presidents and the first president, George Washington. Our first president and uh, how he did everything then to set a precedent for every president that comes after him. The Constitution, very important, obviously. It's a new document. Uh, how is the president going to you know, navigate through the various uh, articles and sections and whose power is what? And what power does he have? What power does he not have? Formal and implied power, right? Formal, or we could say expressed and implied power, right? What is actually in the Constitution? And if you look at it, Article 2 of the Constitution is what creates the president. Right? The executive power shall be vest, vested in the President of the United States of America. That's Article 2, Section 1. And then, of course, then later on, the vice president. Uh, later on, it starts to give a little bit more ideas of some of his powers. In Section 2, we know the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy of the United States. So in peacetime and wartime, a formal power of his is he's Commander-in-Chief of the Army. It also tells us that he can call upon the militias at times to be part of the Army. Uh, section 3 says he shall from time to time give to Congress information of the State of the Union. What was this originally called when he would do this once a year in December? The annual message. At first it was known as the annual message. He would do it at the end of the year. That doesn't say he has to do that. It just says he shall from time to time give to Congress information on the State of the Union. We now call it the State of the Union address and it's given in the beginning of the year in January. Again, it kind of sets out the agenda, the outline for the country. Washington, he will do this, and so this sets the precedent for every president to come after him. But there are these implied powers as well, that Washington, like other presidents, will find it's much easier to live in the world of the implied or the loose construction as opposed to the strict. Neutrality Act. What was the Neutrality Act? What was that neutrality toward? Well, specifically, it was the World War II. It was the World War One. Washington? Oh, we're talking about Washington. <laughs> we're talking about Washington. Sorry. Yeah, but Washington. This all deals with Washington. France. This dealt with France, right? This dealt with you know the French Revolution is taking place, and the Reign of Terror is happening, and they took the King of France. And what did they do to him? They beheaded him with the guillotine. Right? Washington realized we have no navy, we have no army. There are a lot of people who are talking that America should get involved in their revolution because they helped us in this in the American Revolution. When Congress is out of session, he passes neutrality acts. Because there's an argument. Where in the Constitution is the president allowed to decide? if we will or will not get involved in a nation. Now it does say in the Constitution, Article 2, which creates the president, that he can make treaties with the consent of the Senate, so long as two-thirds of the Senate concur. But he takes an opportunity here to wait till Congress goes out of session with them not in the way, and basically he establishes foreign policy without anyone's opinion anyone's input. So right from the beginning, Washington establishes the role of the president as the real leader of the country. Now from time to time we'll see presidents who will fight with Congress, presidents who will fight with the Supreme Court, but presidents start immediately to show themselves to be the leading force of this government. The Whiskey Rebellion, these Pennsylvania farmers, the Scott Irish, are not paying excise taxes, sales taxes on their whiskey. 
Alexander Hamilton, right, the Secretary of the Treasury. He wants to show that the government has a right to tax and that the government has a right to enforce the tax. So they picked on these whiskey farmers. When they rebelled, what did Washington do? He went over there in his uniform. He put on an actual uniform. The President of the United States put on his old general uniform, marched at the head of a volunteer army into Pennsylvania. Said that I will enforce this law if I have to shoot and hang people. The Whiskey Rebellion falls apart. Right? Strong president, strong leader. The first bank in the United States becomes an issue. Jeffersonian Republicans don't like it. They say this is not constitutional. Alexander Hamilton says, hey, but Article 1, which creates Congress, the legislative branch, Section 8, says that any law they deem necessary and proper, Washington chose their side in the matter. Again, taking decisive leadership. Later on, we get a couple, few more strong presidents. Jefferson is a strong president, right? Jefferson is, in fact, a strong president himself. Now, there's always this issue of strict or loose construction. What did Jefferson believe in? Strict construction. If it's not in the Constitution, you can't do it. It's easy to preach that when you're not the president. It's easy to finger point when you're not the president. Hey, it's not in the Constitution. You can't do it. It's not there. You can't do it. But then you become the guy. Then you're the guy in charge. And all of a sudden, everything becomes different. Now you've got to make quick decisions. Now you have to worry about, okay, should I stick with states' rights, which he's an advocate of, small government, he believes in small government, states' rights, which pretty much he will support states' rights. You have the bank out there, which he's against, but there's no legal means for him to get rid of that. His predecessor, though, who comes after Jefferson? Madison. Madison, right? Madison will allow the bank to go away. The charter comes up in 1811, and the Jeffersonian Republicans say, hey, states' rights, strict construction, the bank goes away. But does Jefferson stay strict? Well, we know there's a Louisiana Purchase, right? Here, here's an issue for him. The Constitution says the president can go into a treaty with the consent of Congress. Congress had to deliberate, form committees, subcommittees, Right? Maybe they will go out there and investigate the land. Might take a year, maybe take longer. Napoleon wants to sell it now. Let's form an executive agreement. I don't know if this is constitutional. Jefferson is going to struggle with this. But he understands the benefit of the nation. Right? You're going to double the size of America overnight for pennies on the acre. Is it better? What's the old saying we often say? It's, a, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Have you ever heard that? It's easier to ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry I did that than to actually ask for the permission to do it because someone's going to say no. Okay. Right? Yeah, this was always his case. But I'd rather just do something and let my parents get mad at me later. I'll beg for forgiveness later. <laughs> green in our hair. Yeah, there you go. Blue green. Mulberry versus Madison, a Supreme Court case. Who has the right to interpret law? Supreme Court? President of the United States? This is an issue. This was a big moment in our history. Jefferson and the Republicans want to impeach members of the court because they are angry over the Alien Sedition Acts. Samuel Chase, a member of the Supreme Court, they're already drawing up papers to impeach him. This deals with the Judiciary Act of 1801, the Midnight Judges. Right? We did that during our Supreme Court uh, review. Right? Is Jefferson going to get involved here? Is he going to go over the boundaries? Or is he going to let the Supreme Court decide? Well, in the end, he allows the Supreme Court, right? They, they develop for themselves a judicial review. He's not happy with that, but he allows it to happen. But when it comes to decision making, sometimes Jefferson isn't the best at this. In his second term, the British are impressing American sailors. We want to stop the British from impressing American sailors. The French are impressing American sailors. So instead, let's do an embargo act. Let's not sell any of our grain to the world. Let's stop 
trade with the world. Let's make the world say, oh, we need American products so much. Ah, no, they don't. No, they don't. Who does this hurt? Us. Us. So sometimes presidents who are strong, presidents who are, you know, pretty good. I mean, we get Louisiana. This is a major important moment in American history. But sometimes they also make the wrong decisions. But they're doing it for what they think is the best of the country. Who would you say were probably two other very strong presidents? We say maybe Jackson, Jackson and Lincoln. <laughs> Jackson and Lincoln. Very similar, right? You've got federal versus state with both of these presidents. How do they handle it? You had a nullification crisis with Andrew Jackson. How does Jackson handle the nullification crisis? What does he do? What state is it? South Carolina. South Carolina. Does he allow South Carolina to leave the Union? No. What does he do? He brings a modest army into Virginia. He also sends the Navy down. He threatens to basically burn South Carolina to the ground. Who's the vice president under Andrew Jackson? Calhoun. John C. Calhoun. Right. You'll never forget that. Mr. Neckbeard. <laughs> That's the vice president of the United States. The vice president is from South Carolina. The vice president wrote the South Carolina Exposition. What theory that actually developed with Jefferson? Say it loud. Compact theory. Compact theory. What is compact theory? Because the states created what? The government. That's the compact. That's the agreement. The states came together and created the national government. Thereby, the states could nullify federal law if they don't like it, and if pushed to the brink, they could leave. When did Jefferson first develop that? Anybody remember? Before he was president. Kentucky. The Kentucky-Virginia resolutions. Again, that goes back to John Adams. That goes back to Alien Sedition Acts. Right, that's when compact theory is first developed. It comes back in a bad way for Jackson. But Jackson's a strong president. Right? He's not going to allow the nullifiers to leave the Union. He's going to keep the Union together. Lincoln, he's got the same issue, state versus federal. What state breaks away first? South Carolina. South Carolina. How is he going to have, how is he going to deal with the runaway, sla uh, runaway slaves, runaway states? Let me bring them back with them. Uh, well, well, before we can bring them back, what's going to happen? We're going to have a civil war, right? We're going to go to war. Could you imagine, who was the president before Lincoln? Buchanan. Buchanan. Weak president, right? He basically allows, he's the president when South Carolina breaks away. He is the President of the United States when South Carolina breaks away. Does he stop it? No. He doesn't believe he has the right to do it. The newspapers read, oh, but for one hour of Jackson. Right? If Jackson was still President, South Carolina wouldn't leave. He didn't let him leave in the 1830s. Why is he going to let him leave in 1860, 1861? But Lincoln's coming. Right? He has his first inaugural address. Remember, if the better angels of our nature took over, right, we can avoid this. But he's telling the South, right, in his inaugural address, if you're going to bring war, there's going to be war. You do not, I, I took a sworn oath to the Constitution to defend this country. You do not have an oath to destroy this country. That's what he, I'm paraphrasing, but that's in his first inaugural address. He makes them fire the first shots, right? Where are the first shots? Fort Sumter. And then the war powers, which is in the Constitution. Under war, the president can have war powers. But what are war powers? They're very vague. How does Lincoln interpret war powers? He gets a free pass. What does he make himself? A dictator, right? Strong president, right? Jackson, strong president. Lincoln, strong president. Then the Civil War is over. Lincoln is assassinated. Right? 
We get Andrew Johnson in there and things start to take a turn for the worse. What now happens to the power of the presidency after Lincoln? This emergence of the modern president, but in the 19th century, right? The 19th century is marked by mostly weak presidents. Why? The 20th century, they consistently, we have powerful presidents. Why? It began with Teddy Roosevelt. Why does it bring, begin with Teddy Roosevelt? What does party patronage and industrial revolution have to do with this? Yeah, there's a whole political process that's going to go into full effect after the Civil War. These questions are important questions. We think of what time period do we call this later half of the 19th century? The Gilded Age. It's the Gilded Age, right? The Gilded Age, what is happening? What's happening with the Industrial Revolution? Mumble, mumble, mumble. I don't want to be wrong. We're, we're taping it. I don't want to be wrong. Well, who are the industrialists of this time period? Name me an industrialist. Andrew Carnegie. John D. Rockefeller. J.P. Morgan. Cornelius Vanderbilt. Milton Hershey. Right? He's, a, he's definitely an industrialist at this time period, right? What are they creating for themselves? A wealth, an empire of wealth based on steel, railroad, oil, banking, right? Whole new system of banking develops at this time period, right? The rise of the industrialists, a new industrial revolution, more powerful than the earlier one. At the same time, party patronage has become the spoil system under Jackson, but by the Gilded Age, we start referring to it as talked about it even earlier than today, the machines, the political machines, the political machines. See why we say this over and over again? This is like the third or fourth time in a row we've talked about it and we still kind of mm, forget it immediately. And now we have it on tape so you can hear it again and again and again and again, ad nausea. All of this is happening at the same time. Today we talked about immigration and class. We talked about how when immigrant groups like the Irish came in control of party patronage. It's a way of controlling the immigrants are coming in. New immigrants are now coming in in the latter half of the 19th century. What type of immigrants are coming in now? Eastern Europeans, Eastern Europeans Southern Europeans. Can you name me an ethnic group? The Slavs. The Slavs. The Czechs. The Czechs. <laughs> the Italians. The Greeks, right? Some of us, we just talked about this a few hours ago. <laughs> right? This, just, just earlier today before school ran out. As they're coming over, do they have an experience with democracy? No. None whatsoever. So the political machinery is going to take advantage of this. Do you want a job? Yeah. Do you want a place to live? Of course I do. Okay, I need you to do something for me in turn. What is that going to be? I'm going to get you to vote the way I want you to vote. You're going to become the power base. Now the industrialist comes along, right? The industrialists are not political bosses, but they're going to be have this symbiotic relationship with them. Here comes a power base now for the industrialists. I want to make sure certain laws either do get passed or don't get passed. I'm a capitalist. I don't want anything to get in my way. So we can use the political machineries to our advantage. I also need immigrants for cheap labor. What is what has risen in opposition to the monopolist? Labor unions. Right? Here's a way to weaken labor unions to turn to cheap labor. Immigrants. What I don't need are strong presidents. I don't need that at all. Lincoln, dictator. I don't want that ever again. Could you imagine Lincoln in the Gilded Age? Right? Could you imagine Andrew Jackson in the Gilded Age, who preached he was a defender of the common man? Right? Now we're going to get all these presidents, I have them all up there, right? Since Ulysses S. Grant, they're going to be put there by political machines. Many of them, their elections will be bought by the industrialists. 
the industrialists will actually go out of their way and spend, spend, spend campaign money to make sure their guy is in the White House. So these presidents of the Gilded Age, they're not very concerned about the people. Grover Cleveland, the only Democrat to break the mold of the, we now have the new Republican Party of Lincoln. Right? Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, but he's a classical liberal. Right? He believes in small government, states' rights. He believes in laissez-faire economics. He says famously, people support the government. Government does not support the people. The industrials love this guy. They love this guy. Even though he's a Democrat, he's one of them. Right? He's a classical liberal, which today is very conservative today, right? We don't need presidents who are going to get out there and try to defend the people. When the labor unions go on strike, you have the great railroad strikes of 1877. Rutherford B. Hayes, put there by the political machinery, he calls out the army to go after the strikers. We have in the 1890s, we have the Pullman strike, Grover Cleveland's president. If I have to use the entire army and navy to deliver one piece of mail, right, he uses the idea that you must deliver mail and takes the side of the capitalists, not the side of labor. We're blaming all of our ills of society on immigration. All these immigrants, because they don't know anything about democracy. That's why we have all these problems. So you have all these nativist groups rising up. Presidents are staying out of everything. Until Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt, right? Remember, he's police commissioner of New York City at one point. When he's police commissioner, who did he befriend? Who took that picture book? Oh, uh, Jacob Riss. Jacob Riss. Jacob Riss took him out there and showed him how immigrants lived in slums, showed him the deplorable conditions. Now, I can't say for a fact that this created a social conscience in Teddy, but he apparently became much more socially conscious than any president before him. And he is going to bring back the power of the president. No more are we going to owe our allegiance to political bosses. Now, the political bosses put him in the vice presidency to try and ruin him. So he doesn't owe his allegiance to the political bosses. And then Assassin's Bullet put him in the White House. Right? William McKinley is assassinated. Theodore, their worst nightmare, is now president. Right? They don't want Theodore Roosevelt, but they get him. And then everything changes because of that. From that point on, the 20th century will be different. We get social and political changes. Progressivism is coming. A whole new way of looking at society, the progressives. How do we deal with immigration? What did Jane Addams do? Hull House. Hull House. What is Hull House? That's the name of the building. A settlement home. Education, daycare for your children so you can help you find a job, teach you to read and write in English. Help you find a job. Once you get a job, help you find a place to live so you can then settle into society. The growth of urban life. The growth of the big cities. This is why we, we're getting progressive ideas are starting to happen. We fear socialism. We fear communism. We fear anarchy. And the progressives offered a solution to this. We get a group of uh, writers, uh, media types, who want to expose all of this in America. The muckrakers, right? Ida Tarbell exposes Standard Oil. Uh, you have other guys who expose uh, the, the shame of the cities, uh, the corruption of the Senate. At this time period, remember, senators are not elected. How do you become a member of the Senate? Mumble, mumble again. Who appoints you? Who appoints you? If you're a senator, you represent your state, right? How many senators per state? Two. Two. So who do you think appoints you? Your state. Your state. Okay. <laughs> Two. Let's make the connections here, right? Your state. Right? The state legislation, which has been put in place by the political machinery. So the political machinery then decides who becomes a senator. 
Remember some of the political bosses, George Washington Plunkett made himself a senator. Roscoe Conkling was a political boss, made himself a senator. Right? This is how corrupt this becomes. The progressives want you to know this. We're also, in the same time, rising now as an imperialistic nation. The Spanish-American War happens. America is changing globally. America is changing. America is changing domestically. You need someone who's going to come in here and be able to handle both of these issues. Who better than Theodore Roosevelt? His personality is perfect for the task. He is such a rambunctious, in-your-face, arrogant, sweet, crazy, lovable character of a human being. Who better to say, hey, domestic issues, a global issue, I can do it all. Bully! <laughs> Be it, right? Theodore Roosevelt, the steward of Theodore Roosevelt. He believes in a stewardship of the presidency. His views on his office, he's the spokesman for America. What was his domestic policy called? Anybody remember? The square deal. Every American deserves a square deal. Bully! He called the White House his bully pulpit. Right? A pulpit like in a church where the minister talks, right? where you issue your sermons. Well, the White House is symbolically my pulpit. And that's where I tell America what their opinion is. He didn't listen. What do you think? He told you what your opinion was. And he got away with that because of this larger-than-life personality he was. He is the spokesman for America. And Americans love this. And he creates again now the model of the real 20th century and our 21st century president. Again, why did his actions win broad public support? Well, look what's going on, right? The growth of wealth and influence of the industrialists. This is a concern for Americans. Plus, with immigration, there's now a rise of a middle class taking place. Everybody's concerned. Remember, the progressives come out of the middle class. This is a middle class movement. All of this added up to concerns about the future of the democracy of this country. Do we allow the capitalists to simply take over? Do we allow the capitalists to decide what, is, what we're going to do or not do? Do we worry about immigrants coming to America who have no experience in democracy? Someone's got to do something. This is why Americans will accept progressivism. They will accept this liberal reform that comes. And it's still with us. Right? Liberalism does not die. Barack Obama has progressive elements in his administration. Obamacare, right? that's a progressive measure. We're going to see it all throughout the 20th century. Both Republicans and Democrats will go back and forth with their version of what they think progressive legislation should be. His domestic leadership. Roosevelt will actually use the law against capitalists. We have the Sherman Antitrust Act out there. He'll make sure that Northern Securities, J.P. Morgan's uh, railroad monopoly doesn't become a monopoly. Up until Roosevelt, the Sherman Antitrust Act was used to punish labor unions. Because when they went on strike, that affected interstate trade. So this act that was supposed to regulate and curb the power of the monopoly was often actually used to attack labor unions instead, until Roosevelt uses it. What do you know about the coal miner strike? What do you remember about that? What does Roosevelt do? He nationalizes it. No, he doesn't nationalize it? What is he? What are you talking about? Didn't he... Didn't he, like he threatened to do it. Oh. Because he took the side of, the of, labor. of labor. He's the first president to take the side of labor, right, in the coal mine strike. Up until now, what did Grover Cleveland do? Sent out the troops. Rutherford B. Hayes sent out the troops. 
Presidents never took the side of labor until Roosevelt comes along. Now, you mentioned Frederick, he threatens this because he couldn't get the industrious to listen to him. And he winds up settling an agreement between the industrialists and the labor union. But he took the side of labor. He creates national parks for America. He, he set aside federal land programs, conservation. Roosevelt became very concerned with conservation. After reading Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, what else does Roosevelt do? He fixes the meat industry. We get the Meat Inspection Act. Then later on, you get the Pure Food and Drug Act. Roosevelt becomes very concerned. Now, he didn't like the muckrakers, right? Because he thought all they did was look at the ills of society. But he understood what they were doing. I think with Roosevelt, he just didn't like it if somebody else had the idea before he did. Right? That's really what was his problem. He really understood what the mucks were doing. The mucks. I'm short, and they're, they're just calling them mucks. Uh, he just didn't like that they were doing it, and he wasn't. <laughs> That's really always his problem. You know, he is a look at me, look at me, look at me, self-aggrandizing president, right? And it worked for him. It worked for him. And it brought about the beginnings of social change in America. On the world scene, he asserts the authority of the president. The president becomes the leader of the free world now. Under Washington and the Neutrality Acts, what is America's foreign policy? What do we call that? Starts with an I. Isolation. Isolationism. Roosevelt starts to break away at this isolationist policy. It doesn't fully go away until World War I. We need a Panama Canal. We need an Isthmus Canal. We need to be able to take our Navy from the Atlantic to the Pacific and not have to go all the way around South America. So we're going to get a Panama Canal. It doesn't matter that Colombia owns Panama. We'll just do something about that. And so we get the canal. The Monroe Doctrine, which is the basis of our foreign policy for Latin America, becomes his Roosevelt corollary, his add-on. Yes, European powers stay out, but I can go in any time I want. Right? We're the police officers of the world now under Teddy Roosevelt. He establishes spheres of influence. The Western Hemisphere is the influence of the United States. He recognizes Japan's right to exist in the Pacific Ocean so long as they understand that America also has a right because of the Philippine Islands. This is very important, very important foreign policy he's, he's starting to develop. America has become more and more involved in world affairs. This will greatly influence the predecessors that come after him. You got William Howard Taft and dollar diplomacy, right? Well, just make it rain, right? Make it rain on everybody. We'll throw American dollars out there. Woodrow Wilson, especially, is a very strong president. Uh, his own approach to progressivism will ex very much influence America for years to come. He's the president that gets us involved in World War I to make the world safe for democracy. And of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. The one, I will, yeah, I think I would say the most progressive of all presidents in FDR. Wilson attacks the triple wall of privilege. A lot of progressive measures come with Wilson, more so than even with Roosevelt. And again, because the two men don't like each other. So Wilson really wants to outshine Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, we get uh, the election of senators becomes part of the Constitution, and income tax becomes part of the Constitution. Women's suffrage becomes part of the Constitution with, this, with progressivism. Prohibition becomes part of the Constitution. A Federal Reserve Bank is developed at this time period because of Woodrow Wilson. 
All these progressive measures to control society, to better reform society. But there is a little blip in the road, 1920s. We see a return to normalcy, as the Republicans will call it. Conservatism comes back for a brief moment, but it comes back. Laissez-faire politics comes back. Isolationism comes back. Under Harding, the president elected in 20, you get the Washington Naval Conference, 1921-1922. The first arms limitation treaty. They're trying to limit the number of battleships that you can make and put out there in the ocean. Starts with Great Britain, the United States, and Japan. Later on, other countries join in on this agreement to limit the, the production of battleships. And but you also get scandal, right? Teapot dome. Harding, a lot like Grant. Uh, because he's so hands-off, he's not aware of the people he's putting in place. So we get this where they try to make a grab for the oil reserves. It becomes a huge presidential scandal. Never know if Harding's actually involved or not. Why? Uh, Harding dies. Yeah. Calvin Coolidge. Keep cool with Coolidge. Hardly says anything, right? The lady, he's sitting next to the lady at a state dinner. I bet I can make you say more than two words tonight. You lose. And never talks again. Calvin Coolidge, President of the United States. Again, strong isolationist policies. The kellogg briand Pact. America signs an agreement to never go to war again, along with 60-some other nations. Within a few weeks, almost all of them were at war. <laughs> Very useless thing, but America believes in isolationism. After World War I, remember we had that guy, uh, um, Gerald Nye? I told you, Gerald Nye, the Republican guy, He's this Republican who starts to investigate why did the United States get involved in World War I, and he comes up with the merchants of death, bankers, ammunition makers, and Woodrow Wilson. So America becomes very inward looking again, very much isolation. When Spain goes through its civil war, they pass a series of neutrality acts to keep the president out. Calvin Coolidge, very pro laissez faire. The man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there worships there. Calvin Coolidge. The business of America is business. Very pro business. By the time of Hoover, it looked like great times are going to be here. We're going to have all this wonderful stuff. And then. The Great Depression, the stock market crash, right? Eight, October 29th, 1929. But again, a conservative. Right? He's not going to get involved. He's not a progressive. He's not going to have social changes to try and help Americans. Americans need to do rugged individualism, is what they preach. Make it on your own, figure it out for yourself. When World War I, veterans want their pension not going to give it to them, so they march on Washington, sends the U.S. Army out under Douglas MacArthur to get rid of them. Of course, MacArthur goes beyond orders and attacks their camp. This is what's happened in the 20s. So now we need progressivism again, and we're going to get it with FDR. The president changes because of this. The Depression and World War II. Two major events that take place under FDR's presidency. What we expect of the president in the moment of crisis changes forever now. The Great Depression. Roosevelt, remember in his first inaugural address, I want broad executive powers if in fact we are invaded by a foreign enemy. The only thing to fear is fear itself. Americans want a president now who's proactive. Even if his can-do legislation did, yeah, a little bit for the Depression, but it seemed like he was doing something. And then World War II explodes. We want a president to take charge. Roosevelt gets a third term because of this. Roosevelt 
goes on radio. He uses modern technology of the time period and addresses people with the fireside chats. Americans like this. They want their presidents to talk to them. They want their presidents to tell them what's going on. Roosevelt uses the technology of the day to do this. He expands the office of the president almost as much as what Lincoln did in the Civil War. He redefines the office, touches on all aspects of our lives, the New Deal, all these massive New Deal programs. All this is designed to help create a stronger America. In peace and war, he now, the President of the United States, is no longer just the Commander-in-Chief. He's also now the overseer of the American economy. This is completely changed now. The presidents of the Gilded Age, laissez-faire guys. All right? Even prior to the Civil War, you know, the only time presidents got involved is when there was issues with the bank. Like when Andrew Jackson destroys the bank. Other than that, he's not really going to get involved. You have all those panics. The Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893. Presidents didn't get involved. They just worked their way out of it. The Great Depression, you can't do that anymore. Presidents must be involved. They must help oversee the economy. What type of economics does America turn to? Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics. America, the president, is now the leader of the free world. Wilson gave the world the League of Nations, but America does not join the League of Nations. So it's weak. It falls apart. It can't stop World War II. Roosevelt brings it back in the form of the United Nations. The world begs for freedom. America has decided it will take a role in bringing freedom to the world. Presidents of the United States often talk about this in their addresses to the country, their inaugural addresses, their State of the Union addresses. Wilson articulated to make the world safe for democracy. Presidents, you often use the expression too, a new world order. They'd like to see pro-democracies in the world. From the 20th century onward, especially after World War II, America becomes a superpower. What technology do they now have that makes them a superpower? Nukes. And nuclear energy, exactly. We have H-bombs. We go from atom bombs to hydrogen bombs, ICBMs, right? The capability of destroying the world many times over. But as I always say, isn't it redundant if you destroy it once to try to destroy it again? <laughs> This is what's going to establish freedom, right? This is the last slide. Post-World War II and the presidents. Citizens are ready to resume their life after World War II, right? They want to get back. They're afraid the Great Depression is going to happen, but they want to get back to their normal lives. They're going to look for work. All those men that left, who took their workplace? Well, women, right? All the women. Now they're supposed to go back home and allow the men to get their jobs back. How are they going to make sure, how is the government going to make sure we don't have another bonus army incident like you did after World War I? They pass something that soldiers have to this day, the GI Bill, the GI Bill right? We get the GI Bill. Right. Tired of the war, people were tired of big government. They like to start to see maybe things shrinking again. But the world's not at peace. What other superpower now has emerged? The Soviet Union. Russia, yeah, the Soviet <clears throat> Union. And within a few short years, they'll have nuclear weapons. So where we'd like to see government shrink, we'd like to see, like after the Civil War, people want to see the government shrink. We don't want Lincoln and his dictatorship. We want a small government, and that's what happens. But the world has changed. Right? You can't have a small government. You can't have a president who just says, well, I'll just be hands off and let Congress do whatever it wants. Communism in the Cold War has happened. 
the role of the United States will change forever after World War II. That's tomorrow's lecture. Thank you very much for coming today. You can clap.